chapter 15, verse 4, for whatever was written in former days, like 1 Kings chapter 5, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. So there's something here for the people of God, and it's called hope. So in this beautiful passage, speaking of an incident that actually took place, we find hope. Now you say, how can that possibly be? Well, it's for eradication, and I'll show you in a moment. The wisdom of Solomon continues. He's been granted wisdom by God, and so his wisdom continues. Now we've also said that we see cracks or fractures in his reign because he's not the final king. Jesus is. We know that. But we see Solomon, fractured though he is, being used by God, having been gifted by him with wisdom to do many marvelous things. And here we encounter Solomon displaying a quality of leadership that is vital if the people of God are to succeed to the glory of God. This is not only applicable to leaders, as we shall see in the application phase of our sermon today, <coughs> but we, we know that this quality, this characteristic, this personal characteristic is vital for those who lead the people of God and indeed for the people of God in general. So our application will focus on leaders and then all of us. So today we're looking for a quality, a characteristic, a personal characteristic that is necessary in leading the people of God indeed in living to the glory of God. Of God, And we're going to find that out today as we dig into this narrative because it's, it's, it encourages us, instructs us. So just wait and see. We'll dig here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you today and ask by the power of the Holy Spirit, Guide us, direct us, show us new things, exciting things, to your honor and glory. Show us what we need to know. What is that one characteristic that can be spoken in many ways, but what is it so that we might be better? We ask all of this in the name of of Jesus. I was talking to Reverend Outa this week, and he was telling me about the storm in South Carolina, the rain that came down. And he made a point. He said that even though there were advanced reports, many people didn't take them seriously. And when the storm hit, many were caught off guard, and there were deaths, as you have read. There were people who lost property and people who were dislocated. Um, he had to move for a season. He and Grace had to move for a season. And we were talking as he came back. He called and we were chatting about that, how the storm hit and many were not concerned. Well, at the conference, one of the speakers, Al Moeller, happened to use similar language in talking about storms and he told a story about a storm as a child and how the storm came up, a hurricane, and moved things around and it came up basically out of the blue and people's lives were changed by it. And then he switched and told about the storm coming upon the culture. It's already hit and it's going to hit with greater and increasing vigor. I was, we haven't finished it yet, but I picked up his book, We Cannot Be Silent, by Dr. Albert Moeller. We Cannot Be Silent. And um, <coughs> he talked about 
he talked about the nature of the storm. And he quoted a uh, man by the name of Tom Smith from the General Social Survey of the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago. I don't know how you could put that on a button. It'd be, it'd be a big button. And he wrote this. What we've seen in the last little while is a massive change in one generation, a change that is so great that the majority of parents of young children today were raised in a different type of family than they live in today. It's a huge storm has struck America, and it's been going on for a few generations, and it's intensifying. And one of the themes at the conference was that, folks, we've got to wake up. We've got to trust Jesus. We've got to realize what's going on here. What could have sustained the culture, if God so chose, would have been a church displaying a characteristic that is shown here in the text, in 1 Kings 5, when I saw it, I was riveted to it. Because this is the characteristic that church leadership needed for the, fa for the past few generations. And in general, it just wasn't there. So what is this characteristic that must be in leaders, indeed must be in all of us, if we're to impact the culture in a God-honoring way. The storm is ongoing too often. The church has just sat and said, well, as long as we gain customers and as long as we feel fine about ourselves and everybody's kind of, you know, is okay, <coughs> then all is well, and let's just go on. The storm isn't that big anyway. Other generations have had them. It'll blow over, and that's it. So today we're looking for something. It's the quality in the life of a believing leader, indeed in every believer, that can strengthen the church and challenge the culture. What is this quality of personhood that is so needed, has been needed, continues to be needed, and will be needed in the future? It's going to be needed. We're going to make an impact in this world. Walk with me through the text. Here in 1 Kings 5, we have the opening part of the verses where Hiram and Solomon come together by way of message. And uh, in verse 6, the Bible says, now therefore, I'm just going to read verses 6 through 11, now, therefore, command that cedars of Lebanon be cut for me. This is Solomon speaking to Hiram. And he says, okay, cut the lumber for me. <coughs> and my servants will join your servants, and I will pay you for your servants such wages as you set. For you know that there is no one among us who knows how to cut timber like the Sidonians, or the, in other words, the Phoenicians. So we need to to have you guys do what you do best, and we'll support you. As soon as Hiram heard the news of Solomon, he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, who has given to David a wise son to be over this great people. David, David and Hiram were very close, it would seem. And um, <clears throat> he actually, Hiram, this man of the nations, praises God. Isn't that amazing? He praises God, this man of the nations. Rather reminiscent of Psalm 72, 10 through 11. Look that up later. It's sort of a, uh, one of Solomon's Psalms and a picture of the nations praising God. There's a mission picture for you. And notice this. And Hiram, verse 8, sent, Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, 
I have heard the message that you have sent to me. I am ready to do all you desire in the matter of cedar and cypress timber. My servant shall bring it down to the sea from Lebanon, and I will make it into rafts to go by sea to the place you direct, and I will have them broken up there, and you shall receive it, and you shall meet my wishes by providing food for my household. So this is the deal cut. So Hiram uh, supplied Solomon with all the timber of cedar and cypress that he desired, while Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household and 20,000 cores of beaten oil. Solomon gave this to Hiram year by year. Here's a picture of integrity. Hiram and Solomon getting together and making this deal for timber for the host of God. And they hold up, both, both hold up their ends of the bargain. How amazing. Integrity. Is this the characteristic that we're looking for in the life of a believing leader or in, in anyone who names the name of God or names the name of Christ? Is this something that is <coughs> central and vital? Well, it's, it's important, and you want to believe it. Integrity, particularly in business. I have a friend who, down in the Twin Cities who said to me that he rarely wants to do business with people who claim to be Christians because they often end up ripping them off. So, not a good idea. Uh, <coughs> he was telling me about this one day, and it was very sad to hear, but integrity, integrity in business, integrity in leadership, we hold up the ends of our bargains. Well, that's important, but it's not what we're desiring. Look at verse 12. And the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he promised and there you have it. This is a picture. God at work in Solomon. And God gave him wisdom, as he promised. And there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty. Now, Hiram, as it was in the ancient days, people like Hiram would visit by messenger kingdoms. Uh, maybe a great king was in place, a son took over, or somebody after, and the king would seek to continue the treaty process and the peace process. And in this case, Solomon responded positively, graciously, and they cut a deal. And so a treaty was cut, was made between them, and peace was obtained. Here you have another characteristic seen in both leaders, actually. Solomon, in particular, is a wise man. Is it true, then, the quality, this characteristic, this personal characteristic that is necessary in the life of a believing leader, and indeed in the people of God, could it be a desire for peace, a desire for calm, a desire to, to uh, make things right, to hold together the, the peace, the packs of the people around, not only within the church, but outside of the church, a desire for peace? Well, that's very true, very true. That, that can be a quality most admirable and is desirous. However, that's not what we're looking for. Look at verses 13 through 18. King Solomon drafted forced labor out of all Israel. Oh boy. Now we could dig into this. There are two views. Some say this came all from uh, nas uh, uh, nations kind of people or the Goy. Others say, no, it was taken from Israel. And others would say, well, started off with the nations, ended up with the people of Israel as well. So wherever you want to come down, I would, I would say it was likely uh, taken out of the nations to begin with, but later on in Solomon's reign we see a problem arising, and you can read about that in 1 Kings 12.4, hard labor. But you can see a crack here, forced labor out of all Israel, and the draft numbered 30,000 men, and he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month in shifts. And they would be a month in Lebanon and two months at home. Adoniram was in charge of the draft. No, you would have one month on and two months off. And um, wherever you want to come down with that, it seems like it's a pretty fair deal, but it's still draft forced labor, something the people of God uh, will sense as a very heavy burden and 
uh, 1 Kings 12, 4. Verse 15, so Solomon also had 70,000 burden bearers and 80,000 stone cutters in the hill country besides Solomon's 3,300 chief officers who were over the work, who had charge of the people who carried on the work. At the king's command, they quarried out great costly stones in order to lay the foundation of the house with dressed stone. So Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders and the men of Gebal did the cutting and prepared the timber and the stone to build the house. Here you see another issue. Sound leadership. Solomon, in spite of the crack and the forced labor issue, we know the little bit about the scholarly debates around that. It's still forced labor. It's still draft. There's some little perks in there, one month on, two off. And um, we, we know that that's a problem, but yet at the same time, sound leadership, Solomon works to get the thing done. He works with Hiram, and he works to get it done. Some have said, this is sound leadership. This is what we need in our leaders today in the church and needed them in the past and will need them in the future. Yeah, that's true. Uh, how many conferences have, have we gone to over the years on leadership and come back feeling as empty as, as, uh, as you can imagine? Very, very um, feeling a sense of, is this it? Sound leadership is helpful indeed, very good. But there is one quality that is necessary above the integrity in business, desire for peace, and sound leadership, and it is this. We're going to find it in verses 1 through 5. In the time remaining, we shall do this. Look at verses 1 through 5. You say, why did you wait until the end of 1 through 5? I don't really know. So we'll leave it at that. Now, Hiram king of Tyre sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that they had anointed king in place of his father. For Hiram, Hiram always loved David. There was a relationship there, and these guys got along very well. You know that David, my father, could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the warfare with which his enemies surrounded him until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. Notice this. He gives the glory to God. A cracked guy, given the gift of wisdom from God. That's what he said. Now, note this. Verse 5, here's the answer to the query. What personal characteristic is necessary in the life of a believing leader, primary? It has to be there. And in every Christian person, man, woman, boy, or girl, in order that the church be encouraged. Here it is. And so I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord said to David, my father, your son whom I will set on your throne in your place shall build the house for my name. Note this phrase. I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. Those of you who read the Hebrew Bible, I'm looking at you, Phil. When you read that, you say in your heart, by the grace of God alone, here is the quality. It is a passion for the glory of God. That's it. What is that personal quality that must be in a leader, indeed in all Christians, if they are to strengthen the church and to positively impact the culture, what's it going to be? A passion for the glory of God. He believes the promises of God. 
He wants to build the house for the name of the Lord my God. Also understood as for the glory of God, for the wonderful name of Yahweh. There it is. This is the quality of the life of a believing leader, especially, that can strengthen the people of God and positively impact the culture, and it's a passion for God's glory. Solomon had a passion to build the temple because he wanted to glorify God. Very quickly, we're running out of time. I want to transition to the New Testament. This is not just here. Turn to Colossians chapter 3, 12 through 17. Colossians chapter 3, 12 through 17. In the interest of time, I'm just going to mention this passage was preached by Brother Al in very well, as you recall. And he told us we're called to <coughs> put to death that which is sinful and put on by the power of the Holy Spirit, that which honors God. And then he talked about putting on love. And the Bible goes on and says in verse 15, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. But the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another, in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And here's verse 17. This is the culmination of the passage. This is the New Testament divine comment, if you like, in Colossians 3. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Singular Christian living. That's it in the New Testament. How then shall we apply this? Critical question for our prayer room. What motivates us? Is it personal gain? Is it personal glory? Or is it the glory of God? Indeed, is it the glory of Christ? What motivates us? Is it our own fleshy desires made up to look like it's for God? Or is it really the glory of God? You'll find this in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, in 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. We don't have time to go there. Just know this, that because of the lacking of this quality in church leaders over the last three generations, now there being many good churches, don't get me wrong, but the church, it would appear, should have said something and loudly it's not just right now that the Supreme Court has approved gay marriage. A lot had to happen leading up to that. The church has let go of so much. Again, Dr. Moeller makes a great point. <clears throat> he talks about... He talks about the church's tiny little response to things like abortion, like things like reproductive technologies and cohabitation, no-fault divorce, etc. He brings up all these things and the whole issue of contraception. And he talks about a very important issue regarding reproductive technologies, for instance. He says this, reproductive technologies have allowed persons to have babies without sex. So the pill allowed sex without babies, and the modern reproductive technologies have allowed babies without sex. And he says that, those kinds of, the silence of the church, has, on all of these issues, has allowed things to progress such that marriage has become basically meaningless in the West. Leaders 
needed to have a passion for God's glory and for his word. And for the last three generations, there needed to be a united voice, for instance, against the lies of the culture saying, for instance, that children don't matter, they're just in the way, we'll just abort them. A, a united and persistent force against it, loudly proclaimed, but silence. And on all these other things, cohabitation and whatnot, well, I'm cohabitating, and now I want you to marry me, and... and and, of course, the excuse is, well, we just don't have any money to separate. Oh, what baloney. Yeah. And, oh, pastor, we're living together, but we're not having any physical activity. What do you think? Is there dope written on me or something? Do you, I'm going to buy that? Uh, yeah, we want you to buy that. Mm. Okay. Okay, it's all good then. But a consistent... Powerful voice saying, wait a minute, stop the train, it's affecting all that we believe in. Marriage isn't a contract, it's a covenant. And children come through marriage, and, and it's a beautiful thing in the eyes of God. Get back, state. And there, has been strong, there have been strong voices, and we're thankful for that. But altogether, it didn't happen. So to leaders, continue to pray for leaders, even this week one, for a passion for the glory of God. Does popularity motivate us? Does security motivate us? That's all wrong. The glory of God we build to his honor and glory. And now to all of us, some very quick applications, and then we'll pray. What motivates us in marriage? Is it controlling our spouse? Is it uh, making them feel so hard and oppressed, manipulated, and can't do anything else? Is, it, is that our motivation? What about the glory of Christ in marriage to serve, to serve one another, and in particular husbands to be willing to die for their wives? Where is that? How about the glory of Christ at work? Are we working for promotion? Are we working uh, uh, to make ourselves just look better and get more and more and more stuff? Or are we working to the glory of Christ? What about school? Are we studying for the glory of Christ? Do we want to get good grades so that Jesus' name might be lifted up? Do we want to find a position where we can influence the culture in a God-honoring way? And what about the church, which is a place, a dwelling place of God, if you like, the temple? Ephesians 2, 21 through 22. This is the dwelling place of God. And we'll close with this. When we see Christian service as something to meet our needs, you know the what about me syndrome? Then we've sown the seeds of defeat in our lives and in the church. What motivates us? Is it the glory of Christ who suffered, died, rose, ascended, and is coming again? Or is it our own little religious biz? I say that to me first. Let's ask Christ for the ability to carry out this truth. Oh God, use me wherever I am to your honor and glory. You make me a singular, a person who lives singularly for Christ. Whatever I do, may I do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. God, help me. May there be a turning generally from self-love and flee to Jesus. And if there is a person here whose motivations have just been exposed by the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit is saying, your motivation has always been for yourself, 
then by the power of the Spirit might you flee from self-love and run to Jesus. By his power may that be so. Well, that's enough for today. Pastor Joe, would you come and lead us in prayer, sir? Gracious Father, would you be pleased in your mercy to forgive us for caring so little about the glory of Christ? Would you be pleased to forgive us for not often being even able to articulate what it means to live for the glory of Christ? What a foreign concept. Oh, Father, forgive us for caring so little about what you care so much about. Instill in our hearts a passionate desire to see Christ glorified. Instill within the leadership of this church a all-consuming passion for the uplifting of Christ. Instill in the hearts of us, the people, the desire to be led by those who love supremely the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may we pursue this with every breath that we take. To him who is able to establish us according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested and by the, the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations leading to the obedience of faith, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ. Be the glory forever. 